is rather than using the linear algebra that we uh, focused on in the first lecture, we're really going to, our main tool is going to be homotopy continuation. And in fact, the uh, talk is structured in two parts. So the first part, I really want to introduce uh, homotopy continuation, uh, and, and then I want to talk about the sort of uh, generic points, because remember we talked about generic points yesterday, so what happens when you try to talk about generic points in the numerical context? We'll talk about that. It leads to a concept of what's called a witness set. And, uh, and then also we'll talk about the, the Bertini theorems that sort of underlie uh, some of the software. And so that'll be the first part of the talk. And the second part of the talk is going to be sort of four fairly substantial examples. Uh, so I'm going to revisit the Lagrange multipliers problem I talked about this morning and sort of think about it from the point of view of Bertini. Uh, I'll talk about what's called the four bar mechanism. Uh, it's a more substantial computation. Uh, then I'll talk about uh, parameter estimation in the HIV model. So this is going to be our first encounter with uh, a chemical reaction network. Work. We'll see a lot more uh, about that uh, in, uh, this is actually a biochemical reaction network. We'll see a lot more about that on Friday. And then we'll uh, also talk about maximum likelihood estimate. And so this will be sort of our first foray into uh, algebraic statistics. And then so that, that's the four examples that we'll uh, do. But to get started, for when we do homotopy continuation, the idea is that we have a start system and a target system. And here, f and g are vectors of polynomials. And of course, z is, you know, we have n variables. And the idea is that for the start system, we know the solutions there. So we, we start with the system, hey, I know these solutions. And then the point is, I somehow want to turn these solutions that are known into the solutions of here, because that's the target system. So that's where we actually want the solutions. So the idea of uh, homotopy continuation is you simply have this homotopy between the uh, uh, start system and the target system. So the way that this homotopy is set up, it's really just you know, a, a straight line combination of the two. When I plug in one, I get the start system. When I plug in zero, uh, you know, that goes away, I get the target system. And so it turns out we're going to go from one to zero. Now you might think, don't we usually go from zero to one? The answer is we do, but in this case, we actually want the target system to be t equals zero because there are more floating number point numbers near zero. Because what happens when we have a floating point number, when I'm near zero, there's nothing in, to the left of the decimal point. So I have more stuff to the right of the decimal point. So I, I can get better accuracy within a given precision. And, and, and so that's why we always basically, in a sense, we start at one and go to zero. And so we're, we're going to always be going in that direction and we do the homotopy. And then the idea is how do I actually follow a solution from, you know, of the, from the start system to the target system? Well, what I do is I, let's take a solution of the start system and let's take a, a, a path. So this is just the interval 0, 1. So I just take a nice path and I want to satisfy this initial value problem. So this is a system of ODEs. And, um, so basically, you know, time one, I want uh, this to be, uh, you know, our, uh, this, that's our initial condition, to, at time one to be, you know, this solution, because remember, one is when I have the uh, start system. And then what this uh, thing right here is, is really, that's just the partial derivative of this uh, with respect to t. And so basically, if this is equal to zero, that means this quantity is constant. But since it's constant, and because that's a solution of the start system, at time one it's equal to zero. That means it's always equal to zero. And so in particular, it's uh, at time zero, it's a, a, a solution. So, so basically what that says is that in this situation, at any time, z of t is a solution. So at time zero, it's a solution, but that's of a solution of our target system. So this is the idea of path. So in this homotopy continuation, you basically uh, have a path that connects a solution of the start system to a solution of the uh, uh, target system. And you, what you're doing is really using, uh, you're solving a system of uh, ordinary differential equations. So if you think about what's going on is in the first lecture, you know, what numerical math did we want to use that's really well known? The answer is numerical linear algebra. They know a lot about numerical linear algebra, so there is some wonderful tools that can be applied. Well, here, 
What's the other place where numerics are really important? And that's solving system to differential equations. So we're using that existing knowledge and technology to solve a system of differential equations. And so the idea is that, you know, in a sense, we're doing algebraic geometry, but we're using different tools from different areas. And so that's what gives, so this is this idea of homotopic continuation, what gives this one its, its sort of distinctive flavor. Now let me give some examples. And so I'm, here's my start system. So just the roots are 0, plus 1, and minus 1. So here's 1. So you know there's 0, plus 1, and minus 1. Same thing, same thing. I use different scales. So in this case, I have, uh, you know, you, you see the roots of my uh, start system. And then I, and I, I just tried various different uh, uh, target systems. And, uh, and things can happen. And sometimes good things happen, and sometimes bad things happen. So what's a good thing that happens? Well, this is what you would love, is that basically every solution here, there's a path that leads to a solution of the corresponding thing. So these are now the three roots of that cubic polynomial. Now, another good thing that can happen is that at the end, two uh, solutions might land at the same point. And that's because, of course, this has a double zero. And, and if you think about it, this is sort of the, um, related to the conservation of number idea that I talked about last time, is that you know, when I take this one and sort of, you know, in a sense, sort of specialize, you know, some, some things can end up at the same point, so that's a solution of multiplicity too. So what that says is that you know, I still solve it, but this method is actually also going to tell me the multiplicity. So that's really nice. Now here's another one where, of course, I'm, my start system is a cubic, my target system is a quadratic, has two roots, so of course one root has to go away, and it goes away by going to infinity. Now you might say, like, uh, this is stupid. If you want to solve a quadratic, you know, maybe you should start with a quadratic system. And that's true in this really simple case, but there's lots of cases where, you know, you have a complicated system, and it intrinsically has some roots and solutions at infinity, and, uh, and yet, you, but you don't know how many, and so you have to pick some reasonable start system. And so what happens? So this idea that some solutions go to infinity is an intrinsic part of the process that goes on when you do this homotopy continuation. So these are all actually good behaviors. And of course, you know, the software has to be smart enough to recognize that these two are coming together. It has to be smart enough to recognize that's going to infinity and not just getting large enough. But again, that's the kind of thing that you really would hope happen. Now, some bad things can happen. So, for example, here's the case where two paths cross. And the thing is that, you know, right here, your gradients are getting really small. It sort of gets hard to decide which way to go. So the numerics can get confused when something like that happens. So you want to avoid that. Here, it's even worse because the two curves sort of bump into each other and just sort of stop. So I, I, just, I just can't get from here to here in, in, in this picture. So we were sort of stuck. And then also here what happens is I have three solutions here, three solutions here, but I go to infinity part way through. So if I start following this path, I just follow it up to infinity, and I'm never going to find that solution. So we need something that avoids all three of these bad behaviors. The middle one is the same as the first one. This one? That's right. But, but it, so in fact, what Frank just said is one of the problems in this particular one is that uh, is I'm working over the real numbers. So that's a clear, obvious. It, like in this case, there's just you know, there's just not enough room for these paths to avoid each case. So 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 one bad thing that's happening is I'm working over the real numbers. And so working over the complex numbers is you know is is uh, you know it's going it's going to you know resolve what's going on here. And then in this case, what yeah, so you saw the cast process, but then there's another thing that can happen is that we were a little naive in the homotopy we picked because we just picked a straight line homotopy. So if you sort of throw in a sort of a little bit of a curveball, you can avoid that. That's called the gamma trick. And so, in fact, what they do is you work over the complex numbers and then you use what's called the gamma trick. And so here's this last one that we had trouble with. So remember, that's uh, this one right here. And, uh, and again, you know, I just tried the very naive thing. You know, I had, you know, basically what happened, of course, this is a parameter value where the degree drops to 2. 
and uh, midway between. And so you, you want to sort of you know preserve things as long because here the degree didn't drop till the very end, and, and so so that's good. But having a degree drop midway is is a bad thing, and 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 so. So here what we do, so the first thing is that we use a different start system since we're over the complex numbers because these are three nice equally spaced roots and so that's actually a good thing. They're all equidistant from each other so that's sort of very nice and stable. And the other thing you do is you sort of multiply by a complex number, uh, you know, I think this is roughly norm one, and, so, and you just pick a random complex number and that sort of perturbation is basically going to avoid the bad behavior. So this is an a illustration from the Bates Howen Steen some Maisie Wampler books, or the basic book on Bertini. And, uh, and so here's our start system with our nice cube roots of, you know, these are actually negative cube roots of unity. And, uh, and it just follows to the solutions here. And so basically by use of the gamma trick, I was able to avoid that kind of bad behavior. And, and, and so this is, you know, sort of the paradigm of uh, sort of what you want to do when you, uh, you know, do this uh, uh, homotopy continuation. Now to really make this work, you have to be pretty smart numerically. So you have to prove that a random choice of the gamma really makes this sort of have a generic behavior for all uh, you know, choices up until zero. Because again, at zero, the target system might be very special. But you sort of want, you don't want that specialness to arrive until the very end. And, uh, and then also, you want to make sure that, you know, here, here we're typically, right now I'm in the situation where the number of polynomials equals the number of variables. So I'm really talking about the fi case of finitely many solutions. And so if I, you know, have my start system and I, I know all of its solutions and follow them, well, I'll certainly get some solutions of the target system. Well, I get all the isolated solutions. And, um, and, 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 and of course, the reason I say isolated because, of course, you also might have some positive dimensional components in, in more general situations. Then, of course, you have to, I mentioned this already, that you have to decide if a path goes to infinity or is just going to a very large solution. Um, there's a certain end game as you approach a zero because, again, solutions might be coming together or you might be approaching a singular point. And if you're approaching a singular point, then and the numerics get more complicated, the condition numbers get large. And so this is where a lot of the adaptive precision comes in, because that's actually the next thing. So basically, to really understand the end game, you really have to get more sophisticated. And again, this is part of the idea that you have to decide if two uh, solutions, two paths give the same solution. So that's also part of the end game. So there's a lot of stuff going on here. Then, of course, you do have to handle positive dimensional components, because those can occur. And again, I was saying that you know, we're typically assuming that the number of unknowns equals the number of equations, but, you know, when these are different, you have to figure out how to handle that kind of a situation as well. And, uh, and it turns out there's basically, I'm aware of four main kinds of software that do this. So there's the one Bertini, and that's the one that we're going to hear about uh, this afternoon in the uh, software demo. There's also Polynomial Homotopy Continuation Package by Jan Verschelde, and that one really, in, 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 invoke some of the polyhedral methods. There's the numerical algebraic geometry for Macaulay II by Anton Lakin, and then, uh, and then this homotopy for polynomial systems. So that's homotopy for polynomial systems uh, by T.Y. Lee at, at Michigan State. So these are the four that I'm aware of. Although we'll also see that there's uh, uh, this sort of basically Bertini.m2, which is an interface. So besides this one, there's an, you know, sort of a direct interface between uh, Macaulay 2 and Bertini now. And then so... Well, well, well NAGM2 also interfaces Bertini. You, you can call any of these softwares from, from that one. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so... So now I want to talk about gen uh, generic points because, you know, we, like I said, we talked about generic points uh, yesterday. And so if I have a variety in CN, let's assume it's irreducible and say it has a, it'll have a certain a dimension, it'll have a certain degree. It also has a, a, a coordinate ring, which is just, uh, you know, the polynomial ring modulo the defining ideal. And I'm assuming that's a prime ideal because I want an irreducible variety. And so the question is, What's a generic point of V? Well, in growth indiques, when you look at the, the scheme spec R, well, you know, that consists of all prime ideals of the ring. Well, that's a prime ideal, so that's a point in, uh, in this scheme, and its closure is the variety V. And so this is the canonical uh, 
<coughs> generic point in, in the growth and uh, way of thinking about it. Remember in von der Verden, I described where you uh, have your coordinate ring, and then you go up to the field of rational functions, and then you basically uh, you know, look at the cosets of the variables. They give, so basically you, you think of the coordinates uh, as rational functions on V, and, uh, and that gives a point not over the original field, not over C, but over this larger field, and that also functions as a generic point. But again, that's you know wildly much in a much bigger field, and then uh, and then the question is, what's a numerical generic point? Now the idea is that these two generic points contain a lot of information about the ideal. So you know this generic point, well, I mean it's the defining ideal of the variety, so it has total information. And this one actually also gives pretty total information because if you take a polynomial in here and evaluate it at this generic point, it's zero if and only if the polynomial is in the prime ideal. So this generic point has total information. And we're not going to get that in a numerical uh, generic point, but we want more than just a single random point. If you just sort of pick some random point, could you say that's a generic point? So we want something with a little more information than just sort of picking one single point. So I'm going to talk about uh, sort of a way of thinking about that. And I want to say this is my approach to this. It's possibly different from sort of how the, the experts really think about it. But uh, sort of in my way of thinking, uh, just a random point contains not a huge amount of information. But of course, one exception is just n-dimensional space. Because there, you know, you just think about, you know, you know, if I have n variables, I just make a random choice for each variable. And so here, in affine space, maybe just a single point is a pretty, a randomly chosen point is a pretty good notion of a generic point. And so that's, so for, for n-dimensional uh, space, a single randomly chosen point is probably as good as you can do. But then how do you apply this to a variety? And because the idea is we want to get a little information, uh, we, we want something that's going to have a little information. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a approach that uses uh, Nerther normalization. And we'll see that that, and I'll think about this algebraically and geometrically, and we'll see there that there's some information that we can actually get, and it's information we can compute numerically. And so, so, uh, so, the, so here, here's again the setup. So it's our irreducible with a certain dimension, a certain degree. Then what I do is I pick, you know, so for the dimension I pick sort of complementary uh, generic linear forms and the variables, and uh, and so then uh, you know, so the inside my coordinate ring I have this subring. It turns out these guys are actually algebraically independent, so this actually just behaves like a, a polynomial ring. And furthermore, um, the north normalization says that when these are generic linear forms, this guy is actually finite over that. So, so everything, every element here is integral over this subring. And you know, it, it's basically a root of a monic polynomial with coefficients in that. And, and so that's sort of a nice finite ring extension from the point of view of algebra. When you think of this uh, geometrically, you know, you, you know, these are coordinate rings that corresponds to a map this way, and you actually get a uh, finite morphism that's actually surjective, and, uh, and then finite means that it's proper in the sense of uh, yesterday, but it also has finite fibers. And, then so, the, and so it's basically, it's, it's a very nice thing. So this is a nice geometric uh, kind of uh, thing. <coughs> now when I think about this guy algebraically, you know, both of these are integral domains because my uh, variety is irreducible, so I can go to the ex field extension. And then the degree of the variety, that's actually just the degree of this field extension. And, uh, and so what I do is I, I can use the th theorem of the primitive element, and I can pick a primitive element of this, and then I can take a minimal polynomial. And, uh, and, and that minimal polynomial will have a Galois group. And of course, the Galois group acts on its D roots, this minimal polynomial has D roots, and so the action of the, of the Galois group on the roots of the minimal polynomial, that basically makes my Galois group a subgroup of the symmetric group on D elements, just by you know, how elements of the Galois group uh, permute the roots of the minimal polynomial. So that's sort of an algebraic Galois group that I get. But geometrically, there's another group I can get, a monodromy group. So let's take a, uh, one of our fibers, and, uh, and the idea is that is here, here's affine space. So here I sort of know what a generic point is. I just pick a random point, and I take its fiber. And then, and if this is a random point, you know, these will actually be uh, D distinct points. And, uh, 
and then what I do is I downstairs around Q, I take a loop, and, uh, and so I take a, a, a loop at Q, and that's going to lift upstairs to a path, but when I lift it upstairs, so the gamma hat is the lifted one, so and say it starts at one particular uh, point of the fiber, but the other point will land someplace else typically, because you know, again, when I project this downstairs, you know, I get the loop that goes from Q to Q, but upstairs it'll simply go from one element of the inverse image to a possibly different one, and that's controlled by permutation of the Agawa group. And so I get the monodromy group, which is, uh, again, a subgroup of uh, the permutation group on D elements, because in this case, I have D elements in the fiber that I'm permuting uh, when I do this monodromy. And it turns out that Joe Harris, in 1979, proved that if you set things up correctly, these are the same. There's, there's an interesting, so that's probably not the first time that was observed. I, I, yeah. I think it goes back to Quite possibly, and, and for example, it also underlies, uh, you know, some of the you know, early papers that uh, other people did, like, like Jordan's book on, uh, you know, yeah. Galois theory. It, this is, I don't know if he stated, I, I don't know if he stated it explicitly, but it's certainly implicit in the way he sort of thought geometrically about Galois groups. But but Harris is probably the first one to give what we regard as a. It, it, it is a really good. Yeah, and it's probably the first rigorous proof from the point of view of modern standards, would be my guess. And, but what's interesting is this has a consequence because, you know, a minimal polynomial is irreducible. And an irreducible group always, you know, the Galois group acts transitively on the roots. So this guy is intrinsically, uh, uh, acts transitively. But since they're the same, that means the monodromic group acts transitively. So that's, and that's something to me at least is not obvious from the geometry of the picture. There's actually, Information here, and um, and the point is, is that this well, pattern. That, that's, that's just because x is irreducible. If any two points in x, you can connect them by half. But how do you prove that? If x is irreducible, you that's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you're right. So it's possible. That's right. So, so yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. So, so what Frank is saying is, what you do is, you know, I was thinking about lifting a path. Frank is saying, start with the path upstairs, project it down. Well, then you get a path from Q to itself, and hey, you've got the lift. And, uh, and, and, and so from that point of view, yeah, so I think from that point of view, it is pretty, uh, it pretty, it is pretty obvious that the, this guy is transitive. And the point is, is that in this case, you know, uh, right here, I can actually, you know, when I take a path downstairs, I can do this path lifting numerically. And so the idea is that this is a numerically computable gadget right here, the monodromy group. And so, so now we get to what's called a witness set. And so the idea is that when I look at these random linear forms, that gives a linear map from here to here. So the kernel of this linear map is basically just a, uh, a subspace of a co-dimension K. And then if I pick a, uh, a random point, then, uh, then the then what I get is I basically get my variety intersected, and so this will be sort of a translate of the kernel of the map I get from uh, you know, Cn to Ck, and, uh, and so this becomes a random affine subspace of co-dimension K. And so I'm basically taking my variety and intersecting it with a linear space of a complementary dimension to get a finite set, and that's what a witness set is in, in Bertini when you, you do this kind of intersection. And the point is, is that it not only uh, it has this, so notice that the witness set has extra structure. It's not just a bunch of points, because first of all, the number of points is the degree of the variety. So already just the number of points in the witness set gives you information. And it also has this transitive monodromy action. And so there's this extra structure going on. And so like I say, you, know, you can't necessarily reconstruct the entire variety from this, but you know something interesting, uh, you know some interesting stuff about it. And then what happens is that suppose, here I was assuming that V is irreducible. Well, suppose that uh, V is now simply equidimensional. So that just means that every irreducible component has the same dimension. And then it turns out I can still do an normalization. I can still get a witness set. It still has a monodromy action. But what's interesting is that the monodromy action will no longer be transitive. And in fact, the orbits give the irreducible components. And so this is what's called a numerical irreducible decomposition. So you can actually talk about, you know, uh, you know taking a variety and 
and uh, basically writing it as a union of irreducible compounds, you can do that numerically. Now you have to, you know, th this requires equidimensional, so there's tricks you have to do when you have, you know, components of different dimensions, but Bertini has ways of uh, handling that. And so, so this is actually really nice. That says that you really can do sort of generic points, and the idea is that that's sort of, at least from my perspective, sort of that's what witness set uh, do. But I think, John, you're going to tell us more about witness sets in your lecture, so you can actually do a lot with witness sets. They are very cool objects. And also, again, as I mentioned, Jose has a sort of a slightly more general version of witness set in multi-projective space. So there's, so there's, you know, so this is a really interesting gadget that arises in the, in the numerical algebraic geometry. Now, part of the thing that's lurking here in the background are the Bertini theorems. And so Bertini was a student of Cremona, and his, uh, he originally stated his theorems just for projective space, he used the language of linear systems, and then he came up with versions that applied to irreducible varieties. And his original versions in the language of linear systems look very different than sort of what we're used to uh, these days. There's a nice article by Steve Kleiman that really gives the history of how all that fits together. And, uh, and so, so here's one of the versions of a Bertini theorem, is that uh, basically I take my irreducible variety and just take a generic hyperplane. And then the intersection is going to be smooth outside of the singular locus. And, and so the idea is that when, you, when I do this intersection, I'm not going to introduce any more singularities beyond the ones I already have, is the rough idea, assuming that H is generic. And then also, assuming that my uh, dimension here is at least two, uh, then this is going to be, uh, so this is going to be at least a curve because uh, and, and it's actually going to be irreducible. And, um, and, and of course, other facts that you know in this situation is that, you know, when I intersect with generic H, it actually, uh, the dimension goes down by one and the degree is preserved. And then what happens is that if I then intersect with, instead of one, just H uh, with K, namely the n dimension, uh, generic ones, I get, uh, I get this number of smooth points, but of course, that intersection is exactly the gadget that gives a witness set. And so basically, the Bertini theorem sort of guarantees that, a, uh, you know, when we choose things generically, that, you know, we actually get, uh, you know, the correct number of uh, smooth points of the variety. So that's why the witness set has, that's one way of seeing the witness set has the number of points is just the degree. And then, of course, this intersection with linear spaces, because what happens is that, you know, Bertini works best when the number of solutions is finite, because that's when the homotopy stuff does and when you have stuff that's a higher dimensional well then what you do is you basically uh, intersect to get something now that just consists of finitely many points and then Bertini works with that and, uh, and, and so and that's I, I, that, I and I assume that that's where Bertini got its name is because you know these Bertini theorems are built into the fabric uh, of the of the algorithms so that's all I'm going to say for uh, sort of an introduction to uh, sort of the numerical algebraic geometry. Like I say, we're going to see more in John's talk and also see some nice examples in the software demo. What I want to do next is just give four examples of uh, working things through. And so I'm going to return to my Lagrange multipliers problem. So again, I'm thinking right now C is just going to be a parameter. And, uh, and so there's the system of equations that it depends on the parameter C. And when C is 2, then when I had one of the solutions, x, y, z, lambda, was this. But if you look at that solution to Bertini, here's what you see. And, uh, and so, so this, again, is the difference between sort of, you know, I, I'm used to nice exact solutions I can write down, but, you know, this is what Bertini, this is the language of Bertini. So, for example, the minus 2 thirds, well, that's minus 2 thirds. That's the real part. And so here's this. When the question is, what's this skunk? And the answer is, this skunk is zero. And so that's how Bertrini says zero. So you have to get, and again, that's one of the decisions you have to make. Is this, you know, just something small and imaginary, or is this really zero? And so, and so, so this is the kind of thing you have to do when you work in, in this uh, numerical world. And of course, we saw that these two uh, uh, choices had slightly different behavior because you know here, remember, we got uh, 10 solutions. Here, we got 12 solutions. This seems to be sort of generic behavior. So, how do we actually exploit that? And so, so here's the idea for trying to solve uh, the system. And so, uh, and so, for example, 
uh, when you have vertiti, you have a start system. And, uh, and so in this case, I'm, I'm going to uh, have a start system with, uh, because if you look at my system of equations, notice that everybody has degree two. So it's a whole, yeah, so, so yeah, yeah, so, so I mean, yeah, that, that, that's all, that, that, those are all degree, total degree two in, in, in each, of, each of the four equations. And so I want my start system to also have be stuff of total degree two. And so I just, and again, the start system, you, here I'm just going to use roots of unity. And so I basically have these really simple ones. And so notice that here, you know, by Bazou's theorem, and of course you can write it down explicitly, I have uh, 16 solutions. And so, and so, like I say, you know, if this was a completely generic system of degree two, I would expect 16 solutions by Bazou's theorem. And that's assuming it was generic and I was working in projective space. And, and we don't have 16. And so the question is what happens? And then so what, what uh, Bertini does is it tracks, uh, it, so it basically starts with these very simple solutions and it tracks 16 paths. And what happens is that when C is two, eight of the solutions uh, go to eight non-singular solutions. There's four that end up uh, go to two solutions. So there's, a, you know, this, this four breaks up into two pairs and each pair maps to the same solution. So I get two solutions of multiplicity two. And then I have four solutions that uh, go to infinity. So that's what happens to the 16 paths. Now when I, if I, asked uh, Bertini to just pick a random choice of C, and Bertini is set up to do that. There's one of the commands you can say, just pick a random choice of your parameter. Then what I get is I get uh, 10 go to 10 non-singular solutions. Uh, I still get uh, this right here, and, um, and then two, and two go to infinity. And then what happens is that uh, sort of one paradigm for using Bertini is to start here with sort of this random choice because that gives you the generic behavior for whatever your so basically again you know I'm thinking my original system like this and so the idea is that you know it clearly depends on this parameter but there's going to be a generic behavior because we're working over the complex numbers and so I want something that's going to capture that generic behavior and um, and so that's what this random C does. And so the generic behavior is I have this kind of thing. And then to use what's called a parameter hopotopy, I use this now as my start system. Where I sort of, I know what's going on generically, but notice now if I'm going to go this and then, you know, go from this to the target system with C equals two, uh, basically I'm not going to track 16 paths anymore because these guys go to infinity. So in fact, I'm only going to track 14 paths. So I have fewer paths to track. Here it's a small difference. I'll, I'll show you some examples where it makes a more, uh, a bigger uh, difference. And, uh, and, and then, so the idea is I start with the finite solutions. I have fewer paths to follow. And then what happens, of course, is that of these, 10 non-singular solutions, in their case, two of them go to infinity. And that's what we were seeing evidence of when I did the earlier example of 2.1 and 2.01. Those were particular choices of C that happened to represent that generic behavior. But the point is, is that those guys actually end up going to infinity when I actually try to solve it for C equals two. So that's how Bertini would actually try to solve uh, this particular system. Now the next one is a, uh, more complicated one, it's called the four bar mechanism. So in this case, the setup is I have these points A and B that are fixed, and then I have this uh, fixed triangle, and, um, and so the edge lakes are fixed, but the triangle can move, and also these segments, uh, AD and uh, BC, they have fixed lengths, but they can rotate about their respective points. And, and so the idea is that as the triangle moves, I actually get this vertex E is going to trace out a curve. And uh, let me actually show you an animation. This is courtesy of Wikipedia. <laughs> and so there's the, uh, you know, this item. And so we can see what happens is that this guy right here is simply rotating around. So that's the thing that's really driving it. That's rotating around and everything is following. And I get this nice curve. And so that's an example of a, of a four bar mechanism. And so let's actually analyze this. So here's my drawing of it. And so, so the way I set it up is I, you know, I fixed, uh, 
these points and I actually fix the edge lengths that you can see is there and then you know I've coordinates uh, CS that's sort of roughly for sine and cosine and then you know and then I have these ones right here and then when you set up all the you know the lengths I have you know I have five I have five segments and they all have lengths so I get those equations but it turns out that's actually not a great way to handle it because what happens is that these equations can't tell the difference between this triangle and that triangle because these would have the, 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 the same edge lengths. And, uh, and so what happens is that uh, I'm going to add one more equation and so when you look at this, what is this funny thing? Well what I'm doing is I'm looking at this vector so I'm going from here to here and I'm going from here to here and I'm taking this determinant as basically the signed area of the parallelogram formed by this vector and that vector and that's signed area 6. But see if I do the flip that changes the orientation so if I use this one the signed area would be minus 6. And so by adding this equation right here I, uh, to this system I actually get uh, now so I have basically uh, six equations and if I eliminate this, so this is just classic elimination theory, I actually did this in Mathematica so it's, it's nothing fancy and, and I get an equation of degree 6 that you can write out there and when I, I, I then asked Mathematica to draw the thing and I got this uh, sort of uh, overly thing plus I got this extra guy right here so this is even though this looks disconnected you know this is still an irreducible curve of degree 6 for example Dan Bates checked uh, by using a numerical algebraic decomposition that this curve is irreducible over the complex numbers and uh, but so the question is so how do you actually see this? So I decided to think about that just for fun. And so the picture is my first five equations, so that's these ones right here that are just the distance guys. Turns out that, oops, they have some symmetries because I could flip the triangle. We saw that in the previous slide. But I could also flip the whole configuration about the x-axis because the x-axis is running right here. So if I apply these two operations and iterate them to the red triangle, I get four triangles. But one of the flip, well the one that flipped, remember there was a sixth equation. <coughs> and here I reverse the orientation so that doesn't work anymore. I also get two triangles down here, but again the one right here would also flip the orientation, that doesn't work. This one has the same orientation and so so basically when I have this solution right here I also have this solution right here and this point right here traces out that curve and so you can really see both components in a very nice way. And so, so what we really get is that you know this version right here traces out this component and you know the one down here traces out the other components. So we have a very nice geometric picture of what's happening. Now the nine point problem is to realize that this mechanism has in a very naive way sort of nine degrees of freedom because you know A is a point in the plane that has two degrees of freedom that B is a point in the plane so that takes two coordinates to specify so I get four degrees of freedom from there then of course I can pick the lengths of the edges of the triangle and so that gives me three more degrees of freedom and then I'll, I can also adjust the lengths of these legs that gives two more so that adds up to nine and then alt in 1923 observe that requiring that this curve E pass through one point, that's a constraint. And so if I ask that it pass through nine points, then that should be possible for only finitely many mechanisms. Because I basically, in a sense I sort of have a nine dimensional parameter space, but once I impose these nine conditions, it should be a zero dimensional parameter space. So, which means finitely many, and the question is how many. And, uh, th and it turns out that this was one of the first uh, big successes of numerical algebraic geometry was Wampler, Morgan and Sabese were able to figure this out in 1992 uh, using a version of a homotopy continuation. This was before Bertini so they basically had some Fortran code that they ran on an IBM mainframe to do their computations. They fixed one of the points to go through to be uh, zero, 0 and, uh, and, and introduced some new coordinates that sort of uh, introduce some simplification to things, they uh, basically got it down to eight equations and eight unknowns. And so that's exactly the kind of thing that you expect finitely many solutions, the question is how many. And they solved it by homotopy continuation. But what's interesting is there's actually three bazoo numbers that you could do. So the question is what's your start system? 
And so, what it's, and so it turns out that we have these uh, eight, eight polynomials, and this is sort of how they sort of wrote the, uh, uh, the, these new uh, unknowns uh, that they had. Turned out that each one of these polynomials has degree seven. And so basically, and again, these are affine coordinates. So, th so th this is in uh, C8. If I work in projective space with uh, eight equations of degree seven, the bazoo number is seven to the eighth. And so I, I, I would get a start system with five, over five million solutions. So that would be over five million paths to track. So, you know, it's not outrageous, but it's a lot, and uh, take a while. But then another way you can do it is that just explo exploiting the structure of the uh, uh, equations, you can actually come up with variable groups that uh, basically in these variables, the equations have degree two, degree two here, degree two here, degree two here. So in fact, uh, treating these as sort of, you know, coordinates of C2, then each of these sort of lives in a P2. And, uh, and then, so basically you do a little calculation. And so if you take sort of a certain hyperplane classes and the i factor, do a little intersection theory, um, what you get is two to the eighth times 25, 20. And so you get, setting things up this way, you get 645,000 solutions. So you still have a lot of paths to track, but that's a lot better than five million. Now, another way to think about it is that these guys actually all have the same Newton polytope. And so I was able to, you know, take that Newton polytope, uh, plug it into Polymake. They have a lattice volume command. I got a normalized volume of uh, 79,000. And so by the PKK theorem, that means in this torque variety, the start system would have 79,000 solutions. So using, if I, if I were to use this as my start system, by using Bazou's theorem in this torque variety, I'd have yet fewer paths to track. And so the idea is that there's various ways you can try to try to set this up. And this is part of what's going on. It's when you have a system of equations, you don't just throw it at the computer, you think about it first. And it, it actually took a lot of thought to even get to this to realize this was a better way to do it. And then even when you have this, you don't want to just dump it in. You want to think about what's the structure of the equations. So and this is one of the things I've learned poking in a little of this is that you want to think about stuff before you give it to the computer. That can, because otherwise the computer just says, you know, try something else. <laughs> and, uh, but it turns out that, uh, in uh, Bertini, so Bertini right now is set up to work in uh, projective space or a multi-projective space. It turns out it doesn't have a, 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 it can't work with sort of the, the, the toric variety. So this is something where the PHC, because remember this means polytopal, or, uh, polytopal homotopy continuation. So this one's set up to work in that. And so the idea is that, and it's like uh, what happened in the case of the, Lagrange multipliers is you first want to know what's the generic behavior. And so, and so the idea is that, so in this case, you sort of make, uh, instead of picking you know, the nine points I wanted to go through, I just you know, have Bertini pick randomly chosen points. And then, but ha what happens is that Bertini has a, a nice thing where it, uh, it's a process that they call uh, uh, regeneration. Because what happens is your start system is that and your target system is that and uh, you know this is really simple that's pretty complicated and you know a, a classical homotopy just tries to make one homotopy that goes here and what the regeneration does is it replace it, it does it in steps now does it replace the first one or the last one drawn it orders them based on degrees, so if they're the same degree, it goes by the first one. And so the idea is that what you would do is that in regeneration, you basically take the first one and replace it with just the first of the target, keep the other of the start, so you do this homotopy continuation. Then the next time, you have two, and so you have to go through several times and so that's why this is sort of uh, argued for sort of the level of the regeneration. You sort of have to go through it. And instead of having one homotopy, you basically now have eight. 
And you might think that's going to be a lot of work, but what happens is that um, when you do this, what, you get a lot of paths that can be started, you get a lot that go to infinity, you get a lot of stuff that goes to higher dimensional components, so you get a lot of crud that you can actually throw away at each stage. And once you throw away something, you never have to return to it. So in fact, what happens is that instead of having to you know, follow 645,000 paths, it turns into 152,000. And, and so it's a lot more efficient when you use this regeneration approach. And so it turns out that, um, and notice that what you end up with is when you look at the non-singular uh, uh, solutions, you get uh, 8,652. And what happens is that uh, th there was known for a long time there was a certain six-fold symmetry to the... Um, yeah, so like I say, that, that's been known for a long time. And so when you divide by six, you get... Uh, uh, 1442, uh, distinct four bar mechanism to go through six points. Now I did this, you know, I, I uh, you know, basically it was probably, I think in November or December, I, I downloaded a Bertini onto my Mac laptop, you know, the one that's sitting right here, and uh, it took about 63 hours. Now that's 63 hours real time. I didn't track CPU time or anything. You know, I started it on, a, you know, a, 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 you know, a Tuesday, and 63 hours later, it it it, it stopped, and. Uh, and I, I did other stuff. I checked my email and whatnot, you know. And, and so, so this, this is not super accurate. In 1992, uh, when the paper was first written, they ran it on this IBM mainframe. It took 332 hours on the IBM mainframe, uh, IBM 3081. And I looked up the cost of that just for fun. And if you were decided you wanted to buy it in 1982 when it was introduced, it cost about three and a half million dollars. So, so we have made progress. <laughs> And then it turns out that uh, I also uh, had some communication with Dan Bates, who's again one of the Bertini developers, and he had access to the uh, cluster, because there's a parallel version of Bertini. He ran it on the cluster using the parallel version, it took two hours. And, and so, so this is, uh, you know, so like I say, if you have good computational resources, uh, you know, computation like this is a very feasible kind of thing. Uh, these days, like I say, you know, uh, you know, back, you know, 25 years ago, it was a, a bit more challenging. Yeah. yeah. Is that the cost of the mainframe or the time on the mainframe? That's the cost of the mainframe. And uh, although it turns out people actually back then rarely bought it, you actually had to lease it, and I actually, you know, IBM knew how to make money out of this, <laughs> and. Um, uh, but, but the answer is, so I don't know, uh, you know, because I assume this was a mainframe probably either at General Motors or at Notre Dame that they were running it on. And, uh, and so, but now, remember this is just with random choices. But now what happens is, uh, and, it, and like I say, it took, uh, you know, it took 63 hours to track these paths. It was about doing about 2,400 paths an hour, and it led to this number of things. But this is for random sort of points. In fact, these are random points over the complex numbers in sort of very strange ways. So they, you know, I actually have nine actual points, you know, you know one of which I'm going to pick to be zero, zero. Uh, so eight other points I actually want it to actually go through. And so how do I make that happen? And so again, this is where you use this uh, parameter homotopy feature where I, I take, so I use this as my start. So I basically, I have the random system and then I have, so that's, I now use the, ran the solutions to the random system, that now becomes my start system, because I know the solutions, and I homotop that to the eight points that I've actually chosen, that's now my target system. But the point is, I don't have to start with all solutions, I only have to start with these guys. So I, so I only have 8,652 paths uh, to follow, and so that makes it, and it took six hours on my Mac to do, and again, if you had access to a cluster, it'd certainly be a lot faster. So that's the point, is especially if you're going to do a problem a lot of times, you do the random stuff, you get a good start system, and then from that, you can solve any particular instance you want uh, more efficiently. So this is sort of the paradigm for how uh, um, Bertini sort of tackles this kind of problem.
So that's all I want to say about this one. I want to talk next about a parameter estimation model in a HIV model. So this is based on a nice paper, numerical algebraic geometry for model selection in application to the life sciences. And um, you know, so that's Elizabeth Gross. She's very active in algebraic statistics and stuff. That's Stan Bates, again, with, with the expertise in uh, uh, you know, Bertini. And they, what they sh and they're writing it for sort of you know basically a, a non-mathematical audience. So they're trying to sort of make the case that you know these numerical algebraic geometry is a useful thing. And they talk about model validation, model selection, and parameter estimation. And I highlighted that one because that's the one I'm going to talk about. And so in their example, they're talking about the for the parameter estimation, it's the HIV virus. And the idea is that in the human system, we have this you know, complicated immune system. And it has you know, some of the white blood cells are called T cells. Some of the white blood cells are called macrophages. And both of these are implicated in a, sort of an HIV infection. And the model they came up with, so what's interesting is they have a main paper and they have an electronic supplement. So this does not appear in the main paper. They just say, we did this. And they refer to the electronic supplement for all the details. And this is an example of a biochemical reaction network that we're going to talk about on Friday. But the idea is that you know, you know, T represents T cells, and the body creates them. M is the macrophage, as the body uh, creates them. V represents the virus. And so what happens when a T cell and a uh, virus interact the T cell says, hey, this is bad. We need more T cells. So it creates more T cells. And, uh, and then the, and, 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 but then also when uh, a T cell interacts a virus, it can actually get infected. Now that turns out that's good and that's bad. It's bad because it's infected. But on the other hand, that sort of takes the virus out of the system because it's now inside the T cell. So then the question is, what, is that, what happens to that T cell? Well, there's two things that happen in the T cell. First of all, the T cell, an infected T cell can die. Now, or, now, T cells die of their own accord at a fairly standard rate. An infected T cell dies faster. You can see the higher rate constant. But that's good, because that's getting the virus out of the system. So that's the T cells doing their thing. But the other thing that happens, of course, is that inside the T cell, the virus replicates. And then what can happen is they can release more virus. So this is a bad thing. So, so you have this balance between sort of good things and bad things. And the same thing happens to the microphages, the way they interact with stuff. And then, of course, the virus on its own will sort of uh, go away. And so pretty complicated system of stuff. Now what we're going to do is, so these uh, parameter values of how fast these things are happening, um, these are published parameter values. And what we're going to do, and this is what they do in the paper, is let's assume that we know all of these except for that one. And so the question is, can I then use data to estimate this one? So that's, that's the problem. We have got this nice model, then, and we know everything except this guy. We have some data. We want to do some estimation. And so, so how does that work? And so, and so, so again, here are the variables, you know, the, um, you know the, the T cells, the infected ones, the microphages, the infected ones, and the a virus. And then when you take uh, this system of uh, biochemical reactions and uh, the law of mass action, and, uh, and that's something I'm going to explain uh, uh, on Friday is that it basically gives you a system of differential equations for how these things are uh, behaving. And you know, like, just very quickly, you know, like, you know, the T cells are being created, but then when a T cell interacts with the virus, it creates uh, some more T cells. And, uh, and so, for example, you know, that's the creation of the T cells. That's when, you know, more T cells are being created by a virus. But then, you know, there's other things that happen. So the K2 is uh, right here. So that's basically you're losing T healthy T cells because they're getting infected. And so that's that one. And then this is just the, the normal death of T cells. And so you have an explanation of that for all of them. So you get the system of differential equations. And, um, and then what happens is that, of course, you're interested in the steady state. 
So, you know, so suppose that you, know, you, you have a while, you get sick, you take some drugs, and then things are sort of approach some sort of steady state. What happens in that steady state? Well, the idea is that, you know, that's when all the derivatives are zero, so you just get a, uh, again, when you look at the system of equations, you just get a system of algebraic equations. It involves our our five variables plus this delta five, because that's the one parameter we assume we don't know. And so what we get is a, uh, so that's the five variables, and that's where the delta five lives. And, uh, and again, that's because we're assuming everybody but delta five is known. So we get this steady state variety. And now because we know the other uh, uh, rate constants, you know, we can actually plug in the numerical values and we can use, and so the authors used Macaulay 2 to decompose this into two irreducible components. And, and of course the big fractions that appear here, what the big fractions come from are basically, you know, turning these into rational numbers. And, um, and so that's where, and of course that's where, you know, some, uh, you know, approximations come in because those are, you know, th those aren't exact. And, uh, and so what they get is they <coughs> get two components, the so-called main component and the extinction component. Now this component makes perfect sense. You know, the virus goes to zero, the infected guys go to zero, and then you get a sort of a steady state of the microphages and T cells. So that's, so th this is sort of a really nice, very good outcome. Th this means you're cured. And, uh, but this is one where it's more interesting because in this one, you can actually have a persistent HIV infection. They can stay long term, but it, the idea is it stays at a at a controllable level, and, and so you know so this is somebody that has HIV for a sort of you know a period of ten or twenty years maintained by you know certain drugs and stuff like that, and but notice that the delta five appears which we don't yet know, and so the question is how do we use this model to find delta five? And the answer is we use some data, and. Uh, and so suppose that here's the data that, you know, so we have, you know, basically measurements for uh, all of these things. So of course, what's the totally naive approach? So what would I do, namely? And, uh, and so what you do is, well, okay, I've got the data, I have all these guys, and uh, so I just plug it into the system of equations and solve for delta five. And of course, what happens is because this is approximate, this becomes an inconsistent system of equations. And so I I, I, so that naive approach just isn't going to work. And so what do we do? So the idea is we, we're focused on the main component, but then we also have the data line because the idea is that we have the data of these, you know, variables right here, but we also remember we don't know what delta five is. So this is all the possible choices of delta five. So what happens is these two guys are disjoint. So we want to find out where do they get the closest. And, um, and so the idea is you want to minimize some distance squared. And it turns out there's some Gaussian distributions going in because there's a statistical model lurking in the background. And I'm going to assume that all these guys are equal to two. And so what we ended up getting is basically I want to uh, minimize this. And, um, and I'm going to ignore denominator. So it's really just the distance squared between a point in the main component and a point in the, uh, uh, you know, basically the data line. Now, it turns out it's pretty easy in this situation to find a local minimum. You use some, you know, least squares, gradient descent, or something like that. You'll find a local minimum. And this is one of the powers of numerical algebraic geometry is that I want global information. So I, I don't want to know just, you know, local minimum. I want to, you know, find out all the possible things where the minimum can occur, and then using that, find the one that's the actual global minimum. And so, th so this is the approach that the, where the numerical algebraic geometers have something, I think, to, uh, to offer. And so it turned out, we turned it into a Lagrange multipliers problem. So I basically want the minimum value of this, uh, but here I have, you know, more constraints. And so in this case, instead of one multiplier, I have five multipliers. And so the point is I can now set this up, uh, so it's, you know, it's a slightly more sophisticated thing than my first Lagrange multipliers problem, but it's the same kind of situation. And, uh, and it turns out that uh, when I solve the system in Bertini, there's 16 solutions and some are complex. Three of them are actually in the real numbers. And then when I evaluate d squared at the real solutions, I find that delta five is that. And so and that's pretty close to the known value. So this is an example of how we can do parameter estimation using uh, numerical algebraic geometry. 
Now the next example is one of our first encounters with algebraic statistics. So this is from a paper, Geometry of Symmetric Group Based Models by Korta and Kujas, and so Kai is here in the audience. And so if you have any questions, ask her. I, I'm kidding, you can ask me. But she will probably give you better answers. And, uh, and so the idea, so this is just quoting from the uh, introduction. So what maximum likelihood estimation is, and that's something we're going to see this idea in several other examples uh, this week, is you want to find, so the idea is we have some data, and we have a model that depends on some parameters. And so the idea is that I want to, you know, I want to find parameters that maximize the likelihood of this data for that uh, basically given model. And this model involves a phylogenetic tree and phylogenetic model. And so, so that's the idea is that given the data, how do I find the parameters of the model that sort of best explain, to give me the model that it best explains that data. And so the idea is that you usually, usually use uh, numerical methods, but it turns out that you know, again, numerical method, many numerical methods give you a local answer. Now if you happen to be in a convex optimization problem, local is good enough because the convexity turns local into global and, and you're very happy. But uh, lots of times this is a non-convex optimization problem. So even though you might find a local one, it might not be a global one. And in fact, some of these models aren't even compact, so the maximum likelihood estimate might not even exist. And one of the things that the, they do in this paper is they use uh, numerical algebraic geometry to show that the MLE doesn't exist. So it's the, the, the CFN, so that's the three biologists that came up with the model. That's their initials. And the K13, so that's the you know, complete bipartite graph uh, on that number of uh, vertices. So basically on this model for a specified data vector, they actually prove that the MLE doesn't exist, even though you can find some things that locally look like they might be candidates, but in fact they actually aren't. And it's a, it's a fairly sophisticated analysis. So the model is that, so here's our, you know, so here's the one, there's the three, so there's the K13. The idea is that you have a, a root in three leaves, you have some probabilities at the root, and then you have some transition matrices that dictate how things propagate uh, along the edges, and, and these are given by uh, this, and these are the parameters, and these are the things that determine the model. So, so that, that's the kind of stuff we have to do to figure out what model we're in. And this is actually a group-based model, but in this case it's a very simple group. So the group is just Z2, so it's just zero, one. And so that's why we just have zeros and ones is the possible thing. So the point is there's a zero, one here, a zero, one here, and a zero, one here. So I get basically, when I look at the, there's eight possibilities for the probabilities of the, at the leaves. And they calculate, you know, using the pi naught up here times the, you know, corresponding entries of the transition matrices. And, and, and so that's uh, what we get. And it turns out that these, uh, you know, the question is, what are the possibilities for these PIJs that can occur? Well, you know, they're probabilities, they're greater than or equal to zero, you want them to add to one, and it turns out that you, you get some, uh, uh, you know, quadratic equations, you get some strict linear inequalities, some quadratic weak inequalities, and so, you know, it's a, you know, the full understanding of what's going on uh, of, you know, what this probability space is is actually pretty complicated. And so the idea is we have some data. And so the idea is that we want to pick the point in the model that best explains the data. And so again, we want to have a global maximum of this guy. So that's the usual thing that happens. And, uh, and again, the standard methods will give a local maximum. And, and so, so what do the authors do? Well, the idea is what they do is they, you're looking at sort of uh, critical points of this guy. And what they do is they study complex critical points on the Zariski closure of the model. And so in this case, what that means is you sort of ignore, uh, you basically just look at the, uh, you ignore the inequalities, you ignore this, ignore this, and basically you just ignore that. But also when you look at this, what happens is that this product right here, that's basically uh, what that's doing is uh, giving you a point of the Segre embedding of P1 cubed. And so that's what that is. So here's, uh, here's a point of the Segre embedding of P1 cubed. Here's another point. And here I'm taking this 
you know, combination of them. And that's basically on the secant line connecting these. So in fact, from the point of view of algebraic geometry, what we've got is just the secant variety of the Segre embedding of a P1 cubed. And so as so it, an algebraic variety, it's a very nice, and it turns out that uh, the number of uh, complex critical points on this variety of that functional, that's called the maximum likelihood degree, and it's equal to 92 in this case. And so the idea is that, you know, there are possibly 92 critical points, but it actually gets more complicated, and this is where I don't fully understand, because you actually have to study the boundary of the model. And so, because the idea is it's not just in the interior where things can happen, but it's also in the boundary points. So you have to sort of look at relative mins and relative maxima. And it's where some of the inequalities become zero. And what they did is, they, by analyzing the boundary, they actually found 44 varieties of lying on the boundary. They had 167 critical points. And for this, they ended up using the PHC pack to do the calculations. And it turns out that when they analyzed all this, the winner, basically, one of the parameters was equal to infinity, is one, the one that actually gave the actual uh, uh, global uh, maximum of this. But that's not something in your model. And so that point is, so this is the proof that there's actually no maximum likelihood estimate in this example. So this is an example of using, you know, so you know, it's a pretty complicated setup they had to do to uh, actually do this using the numerical algebraic geometry. And, uh, and yet you ended up getting a sort of almost counterintuitive kind of thing because again, you'd find plenty of these guys. And so you might think that, oh, just look at your local maximum, take the max. It's not good enough. You really have to do this more sophisticated analysis to understand this example. And so that's pretty much uh, everything today. So, you know, I talked about homotopic continuations, omitted a lot of stuff. And, um, and then I sort of went through four examples to try to give you some flavor. You know, I did something, you know, this example now looks very naive compared to what we've just looked at. The four bar uh, mechanism had some really fun stuff. Uh, and then we, you know, talked about the uh, biochemical model, more stuff we'll see on uh, Friday, and then we also did a little bit of algebraic statistics. So this begins to show the scope of uh, numerical algebraic geometry. And of course, we'll learn more about this uh, uh, later today when John uh, talks about uh, his lecture and also the software demo. But then, of course, tomorrow we'll switch gears and talk about geometric modeling. So that's it for today. And also, I want to introduce Alicia Dickenstein. So she's going to be the uh, speaker. So everybody say hi to Alicia. We just got off the plane, you know, flying from uh, Buenos Aires, and so if, if she's a, you know, slightly out of it today, that she has a reason for being so. <laughs> so, so anyway, so any questions? Yeah. For, for, a, for a specific choice of the data, there wasn't uh, MLA. And uh, did you know what happens for generic data? I mean, for generic data, one expects to have MLA. Right, right, okay, so, th so that's the idea. And, and how did you choose that special data? Well, that's chosen randomly, but like, things happen if you choose something close to those bonkers that are not like, included in the model. I see. Yeah, because that's the idea. Because remember when I talked about the model, um, Remember one of the things I said is that the uh, model is almost characterized. And so it was, I think, going in the, so when you sort of take the complement of this stuff, is that's where you're sort of looking, I think. And so, so this is a case where you really had to understand exactly really what the model was and, and realize there's some stuff just outside it where things, act, where you know, a maximum might actually occur. Yeah. Orbital, could you talk about what the symmetry is? And also, so, incorporate that symmetry into the homotopy continuation? Yeah, so the answer, so, so it's also one thing I've been forgetting to do is that when somebody asks a question, uh, because of the video recording, I'm supposed to repeat the question, which I just finally realized, so I apologize for not doing it. So, so you're asking in the, in the uh, nine point problem, is it possible to incorporate those symmetries into the uh, equation so that uh, you in a sense, uh, simplify stuff? And the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Two of them, so it's a two, there's a two way and a three way. Yeah. The two way symmetry you can, the three way symmetry it's still unknown how to do that. Right. 
But, but there's, a, there's a paper of Jose where he talks about exploiting such symmetries. Because mm. there's an interesting uh, Galois group here. Right, right. It's probably the symmetric group on 1442 letters in each product, S6. <laughs> Yeah, so, and again, it's, uh, it's the case, and for example, like another case I know about, I was talking about you know, having to think about the equations before you put them in Bertini, there's also the, the Stewart platform that's pretty famous. And it turns out if you, because basically there, you're, the variety you're working in is uh, basically the, the, the special Euclidean group in three dimensions. And then that's where you're trying to solve equations. And if you try to write that down just as an algebraic group by you know, uh, polynomial equations, it's a real mess. But if you represent rotations by quaternions, you get a really efficient system. And so, so the idea is there by representing the rotation part as a quaternion and, and using what's called the studi quadric, you actually get a very efficient way of doing stuff. And so the idea is that for these systems of equations, it's sometimes, like I say, there's a lot of thought needed before you, you, you stick it in the computer. Well, it's probably the other way around. You, you, you press the, the return button on your computer, and when it doesn't compute, you start thinking. That's right. It's real life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> So I remember that was the first time I tried to use Macaulay in 1985, and I was on the Mac this high, and I had like 18 equations and you know, you know, 27 variables, and you know, I was totally naive. I put it in, took three seconds to fill up the memory, and that was the computer saying, "David, you need an idea." <laughs> Any other questions?